a, uh, a graphic from uh, a report issued by McKinsey's uh, a couple of years ago uh, talking about what it costs to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, it's a supply curve, if you like, or a marginal cost curve for the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, what it's showing you on the uh, vertical axis is the cost of cutting back emissions, and on the horizontal axis it's showing you how far we reduce emissions. And what is interesting about this is that it's showing that you can reduce a substantial amount of emissions at a zero or negative cost. Uh, that I think the part of this, um, which is to the left and below the horizontal axis, indicates that there are some opportunities for reducing emissions which actually pay for themselves. So, uh, for example, on the street left, we've got building insulation. This is indicating that better insulation of buildings, better heat treatment in buildings, uh, is something which will significantly reduce emissions and will also pay for itself over a reasonable commercial period of time. Uh, so there's actually no net. If you're taking a reasonable time period perspective on this, there's no real cost uh, to reduce emissions by that route. And we can get significant reductions. Uh, up to the order of five, gigatons per year uh, from um, sources which are basically zero cost or even negative cost. And even when we go to the positive part of this curve over to the right, uh, you'll notice that um, very significant reductions can be obtained uh, at a price of less than $50 a ton uh, to abate carbon emissions. Um, and you know, the prices in the European Union's emission trading scheme have at points in the past reached as high as $30 a ton US. Um, they're low, below that at the moment, but will presumably come back up once the recession ends. Um, so the, the costs of going green are significant, uh, but not enormous. Um, and as I said, some of these will pay for themselves in a number of years. Now, the, um, the publications like the Stern Review, which you heard a little bit about uh, in the previous presentation, uh, look at the, the cost of stabilizing greenhouse gas emissions at around about 500 parts per million. That's the, what Dimitri was talking about earlier. And the general estimate of the cost of this on a global basis is it's somewhere between 1% and 2% of uh, world gross domestic product. Uh, that's a big number if you list it, which has a lot, lot of zeros after it. But actually, you know, putting it in perspective, it's a smallish number. I mean, most people would not notice if their incomes fell by 1%. Most of you probably don't know your incomes to within 1%. And I'm quite certain we don't measure gross domestic product to an accuracy of more than plus or minus 2%, uh, possibly even worse than that. Uh, so uh, a cost of 1% to 2% of GDP is, is big, but is obviously a sustainable and an acceptable level of cost. Um, now, we get back to the issue of the recession. These costs of going green, which I think are not enormous in the first place, are reduced by the recession. And the, point, the key point to understand here is that from a social perspective, the cost of using unemployed labor is zero. If you've got people who have no jobs, then the cost of taking them and putting them into jobs, for example, building renewable energy power stations, that cost is zero. Now, the social cost of employing someone uh, in renewable energy is the cost of the opportunity, the opportunity cost. It's the cost of the output which they can't produce elsewhere when we put them to building a green power station. If they were not producing any output elsewhere because they were unemployed, then that social cost is zero. Uh, so in some parts of the European Union at the moment, for example in Spain, we have a very high rate of unemployment. I mean, the last headlines I saw for Spain were 17%. That's almost one in five of the population, working population unemployed. In a framework like that, uh, the social cost of employing people on green projects is effectively zero. There may even be a small social benefit in the sense of just switching from a situation where the government has to pay them welfare payments to a situation where they're earning money and the government may actually be receiving tax revenues from them. Um, so the, the labor element of the cost of going green is greatly reduced uh, by the current recession. Uh, I haven't, you know, it's difficult to know exactly what this, the nature of this reduction is, but at a rough guess I'm thinking 25 to 30 percent at least, somewhere between a quarter and a third of the cost is reduced by the scale of unemployment that we have uh, in, the, uh, in the industrial countries at the moment. So these costs of, of going green are significant in the first place, but, the, but, but acceptable and are somewhat reduced uh, by the current situation. 
Now let me talk on the other hand about the uh, other part of this balance. I said in thinking about the economics of climate change, we're balancing on the one hand the cost of going green, on the other hand the cost of not going green, the cost of allowing climate change to proceed. And I'm going to argue that these are very substantial and they're also not in any way reduced by the current recession. So the current recession is having an asymmetric effect. It's reducing the costs of taking action on climate change. It's not reducing the benefits. And mainly because the, the costs are up front. The costs are the cost of things we have to do in the next five to ten years. And those costs are reduced uh, by this current scale of unemployment. Uh, the benefits occur a long way into the future, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years into the future. And hopefully the recession will be long, long over by then. And those, car, those benefits will not be affected at all uh, by what we're doing by the, the current situation. The costs of... Um, Allowing climate change to proceed is sort of summarized under a set of headings here. And I'm sure you're all very familiar with this, but I'll just say a little bit about each of these. Uh, that the cost of sea level rise, or the impact on agriculture, impact on fisheries and seas, human health, uh, water availability, and the impact on sort of, the biological world around us, which I think is perhaps one of the aspects which is in the long run very important and has been somewhat underemphasized in a lot of the discussion of climate change. So... Um, if we talk about sea level rise, for example, uh, then there are potentially uh, major costs uh, associated with the loss of major cities, infrastructure, farmland. You know, most capital cities in the world are actually on the sea. Uh, and you know, sort of a, a 10 meter rise in sea level would put many, many capital cities underwater. Um, Athens, I guess, is somewhat more free than most, but I'm currently working in London. Much of London is within a few feet of sea level. Much of New York is within a few feet of sea level. Um, to take a very concrete point, I regularly fly into and out of New York. There are three big airports in New York, Kennedy, LaGuardia, and Newark. All of those airports are within a few feet of sea level. Uh, now, by 2040, 2050, all of those airports could be subject to inundation. The cost, you may, if you just think, to make these things concrete, imagine the costs of moving three huge airports uh, somewhere to higher ground. Uh, now, the amount of political argument you have, for example, in London at the moment, just about extending the runway of one runway of one airport is huge. I um, mean, sort of the, you know, the, the social cost and disruption associated with moving three massive airports uh, so that, that are away from a rising sea level would be absolutely huge. And roughly half of Manhattan is within a couple of feet of sea level. Um, so and that, that sort of pattern is repeated in London, it's repeated in Tokyo, repeated in many, many major cities around the world. Slightly less than a billion people live within about three feet of sea level. There's a lot of agricultural land within three feet of sea level. Um, so there's very, very substantial costs of rising sea level. And all of those costs will be unaffected by the current recession, obviously. I mean, I hardly need to say that, but it's an important point.